This is CPSC 526, Lecture 4 on Authentication. So, our next topic, Authentication. This is the process of using supporting evidence to corroborate an asserted identity. This differs from identification or recognition, which aims to establish identity from available information without some sort of assertion. Meaning that authentication refers to a situation of I'm Joel and here is my face or a picture of me on a, some sort of identity document versus me arriving somewhere and a computer saying that's Joel. These are both related to a key security per concept of authorization, which is determining whether or not a request should be granted based on who is that, who's requesting it. So someone wants to print, there's a system that decides should they be allowed to print, and that decision would be made based on identifying who's trying to print or authenticating getting to know exactly who is the one trying to print. For authenticating users, particularly with computer systems, there's a notion of something you know, passwords, PIN codes, when you enter a code on a bank. This is the something that you know concept of authentication. There's also something that you have, things like a bank card, or a hardware token, uh, a thing that prints out numbers that you can then type in that are randomly changing, or something that you are, for instance, your fingerprint, your iris scan, something biometric about yourself. And the difference between this, something that you know, things like a password, you have this thing in your head and you're keeping it a secret, so no one knows it but you. You're the only one who knows it, aside from the server who also knows it. So the moment when you type that in, the server can conclude, aha, it's, it's Alice. Alice is the only person who knows this. With something that you have, this is nice because when you lose it, you notice. So if you lose your bank card, you can tell your bank, this card isn't good anymore, I've lost it. And so even if someone knows your PIN code, your bank card isn't useful because there's an actual physical thing that actually has to be in the possession of the person in order to withdraw money. So a password is a secret that is associated with a public user identity, user ID. So to authenticate with a password-based system, the user sends their user identity, their username, and their password. This is what makes it authentication and not identification. The server then looks, looks up the password for the user, figures out whether or not the password is correct for that user, and if it's correct, grants them access. If it's not correct, does not grant them access. So what are some attacks on password-based systems? What are the attacks on them? And passwords should be a familiar concept, so you can pause and think about some attacks on your own and see how they relate to this list. Well, first, we have online guessing attacks. This is where an attacker just goes to Gmail and types in your username and tries to guess your password. And they try a bunch of times. They keep trying until they get the right password or they're it gets kicked off. There's eavesdropping. The attacker on the network monitoring the communication between Alice and Bob is able to see the password. Say Alice just transmits the password to Bob in plain text and the attacker sees it. Well, then they would learn that password. There's server compromise. The attacker compromises the server 
And the server knows the password, so the, they just learn the passwords because they compromise the server, or maybe they run the server. Or they socially engineer the user. They, the attacker fools the user into revealing their password. They present them with a login screen, and in the login screen, they are supposed to enter their password, and they enter the password for the wrong site because the login screen makes it look like it's that actual other site. You know, phishing attacks. Or client-side malware. There's a keylogger or something like that. There's malware on the user's machine that when the user types their password, the attacker learns it there. So the attacker can be everywhere. The attacker can be on the network, they can be on the server, they can be on the client. The attacker can just pretend to be the client and keep trying. Or the attacker can pretend to be the server and fool the client. Many possible attacks. So what are some solutions? Well, for online guessing, we have some good solutions. We can rate limit, lock out the the account. Attacker tries to try 10 passwords, the user's account gets frozen for five minutes or something like that. Maybe not a huge penalty, but the attacker cannot try millions and millions of passwords by simply doing them one at a time. If a user account is receiving too many password attempts and they're failing, the server can throw up a CAPTCHA, a completely automated public Turing test to tell computers and humans apart. Turing test in this context refers to this idea that a computer is trying to fool a human into thinking the human's having a conversation with another human that they, they, they can't see each other, but it's actually a computer program running. And in this case... You can throw up a CAPTCHA, a puzzle that computers aren't good at solving but humans can solve, such as you know, doing some sort of uh, data classification on images. And this will have the effect of slowing down the rate of automated guessing and make sure that it's actually a human who's doing it, not a computer program. The, this requires, though, that the user's password is hard to guess in the number of allowed tries. So a server that, say, allows 100 tries, well, then user's password should not be the 100 most easiest obvious passwords because those would be the ones that are likely to be tried. And this is the only benefit of having these password requirements, things like length and punctuation and capitalization. These annoying things that get in the way of people's using of computer systems and make passwords hard to use because different sites have different rules for their passwords. But it's trying to do a good thing, which is to have passwords that are hard to guess. Have passwords that are not just a single number, a short number, or a simple word but is only useful against these online guessing attacks, as we'll see. Because an attacker who compromises the server and who can read the password file will be able to try as many guesses as they want. What about for eavesdropping, the attacker on the line? Well, we can use encryption to secure the network communication. We'll get into protocols for that later. But we've already discussed the crypto side of things. And we know that these tools like AES and HMAC exist. So we can achieve the delivery of messages securely and authentically from Alice to Bob. So the attacker can't read the password. Hopefully, it's not being just sent in plain text. What about for server compromise? Well, if the passwords were just stored on the server, the server stores user and password for every single user, 
well, a attacker who compromises the server will simply learn everyone's passwords. So this is not good at all. Right? We don't want the actual plain text password stored. So what can we do? Well, if we think back to the previous lecture, rather, I'm jumping ahead a bit, approach two, we could store an encryption of the password for some key K. So we store the user, and we store the pa user's passwords encrypted with a key K. Well, what's the problem here? The problem is that any server that is authenticating a user will receive the password, it will need to use the key K to encrypt the password and then check to see if the encrypted password matches any of the passwords on his password file list. This means that the server is going to have the key in memory. A server that's constantly authenticating users is just going to have this key available because it can't do its job without this key. So if the server has the key in RAM, for example, or access to it in a file, there is no real difference if an attacker compromises a server, they're going to get the key as well. It's not a challenge if the server is using this key all the time for an attacker to then be able to also get this key. So now, thinking back to our previous lecture, what if we stored the user and the hash of their password for every user? Right? The, the hash is pre-image resistant. Meaning that given the hash, you can't figure out the password. The attacker compromises the password file, gets the list of users and all their hashes of passwords, but they can't get the password themselves. And keep in mind that the server can trivially authenticate users. A user sends the password, the server hashes it, and then checks to see if the, hash were, uh, the password matches the hashed word. But there's a problem here. And the, end, the, the, the problem arises from that magic trick where we had 52 cards and the magician was able to simply hash all of the possible things that the password could be in this case. If you have a narrow domain, if you have a small domain of possible passwords, as in the 10,000 most common passwords, then you could easily mount a brute force attack. You hash the top 100,000, top 10 million passwords, and then you check to see if any of these appear on your list. And if they do, then you figure it out what that user's password is. So what about hashing it many, 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 many times. So approach four, the server stores the user's name and the hash of the hash of the hash of the hash of the dot, 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 say a thousand, a million, however many times is reasonable for the server to do every single time a user wants to authenticate of their password. This, in effect, just slows down the same attack here. Right here, if the attacker wants to try 10 million passwords, they have to do 10 million hashes. But here, if they want to do 10 million passwords, they have to do 10 million times however many times each password is hashed. Pa ha hashes. So if a password was hashed a thousand times iteratively, they'd have to do 10 billion. Or if they did a million times hashing, the attacker would have to do 10 trillion, right? So you can make it arbitrarily hard for the attacker in this way. You just strengthen the key, so to speak, by hashing it so many times so that this brute force attack becomes slower and harder to do. In a sense, it's really just using a function, a hash function that's slow, a slow to compute hash function, intentionally slow, not so slow that the server can't actually do anything anymore. It can still authenticate users. Maybe it takes half a second 
per user as opposed to to a millisecond. But for the attacker, it's now very, very slow to mount these attacks. In particular, if the hash function h is a thousand times slower, then a password a guessing attack that would normally take a day would now take three years. So here now, as long as your password is far enough down the guest list that the attacker would hazard is your actual password, and each guest takes long enough to do offline, that you've managed to strengthen your password in this way. You've introduced a long delay for the attacker. This repeated application of hashing is also called a hash chain, and it is used to perform key strengthening, is the name of this technique. The idea being you repeat hashing, so it's still fast to execute in practice when you're checking the passwords, but it becomes infeasibly longer for an adversary to compute all of the password's hash values. Now, this helps. However, it's still not perfect because what if the attacker simply stored a huge list of every single hash rather every single password and its corresponding hash you know 10,000 times let's say 10,000 repeated hashings was the standard that everyone was using and so the attacker just computed a giant dictionary mapping passwords to what would appear in a password file now the attacker would still have to invest all of this time to compute all these hashes Right, This day-long hashing now takes three years. If you wanted to break a single password, that would normally take a day to break with a single hash. If it takes three years because of password strengthening, well, if the adversary simply built this table, this table is useful for more than one single password. Once this table is built, it's then just built. It exists. And so the attacker can then break as many passwords as they want. They've built the lookup table. They just have to build it once. And since hash is a public algorithm, they can use thousands of computers or millions of computers or volunteers to build these tables so that the cost of actually doing this attack is distributed. Because once these tables that map passwords that what their hash would be are constructed, you can then just go around reversing hashes in constant time. You just look up the hash, get the password, as long as it's on your table. Now, the number of possible passwords is, of course, huge. There's a huge number of possible passwords. Now, as we'll see, the number of typically used passwords is, is very small. There's not that many passwords that are actually used. Most people choose passwords that are typically easy to guess. But still, if you were to simply guess an arbitrary password and it wasn't among the top 100,000 most common passwords then the set of possible passwords it could be is very large indeed. And you can store the password in the hash for the first 100 billion easy-to-guess passwords, and this is around 3 terabytes. But after that, you'll have to, to start, you'll just have to go back to your original approach of guessing. So if your password is in the first 100 billion guesses, then it could easily fit in the 3 terabyte table that stores all the passwords and their corresponding hashes. 
But there's an approach, actually, to store, to, in a sense, compress this information even further. Now, this was known as hash chains, and it's not the type of hash chains that we just talked about. It's a different definition of hash chains. Um, and this comes from 1980. So, as a historical note, we have to imagine that at this time, three terabytes of passwords for the first hundred billion would have not even been something that you could imagine, for instance, having on your personal computer available at your disposal, but it would be outside the realm of, of, of what would be imaginable for any outside of a, 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 a high-powered computer center. So in their paper, a cryptographic time memory trade-off, they came up with an approach that allowed you to store, in a sense, more hashed password information without having to store every single password in this table. So, in effect, their solution was to use a function r that maps hashes back to the domain space, back, that is, back to password space. So there's two functions, h, which in this case is however many times the actual password hashing occurs. So if you're hashing a password 10,000 times by hashing, 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 that's what we mean by here by h. So h maps password to what gets stored in the password file. r is a function that maps a hash back to a possible password. Now, this R function, it doesn't need to be a hash function. It doesn't need to reverse it. it it's not supposed to, in fact. It, it shouldn't go from the hash back to the password. It just needs to be any good faith random mapping. Mapping an arbitrary hash to some particular word. The idea is that you're doing a random walk. You're going from a random password to a, its corresponding hash and then back to some other random password and its corresponding hash, and then back to some new random password and its corresponding hash, back and forth and back and forth. And this chain of hashing is where you get your compression. That is, you start a chain at a particular password, and you end it at some arbitrary hash when you're when you're done. And you build a chain, you can make them arbitrarily long, and say your chain is 1,000 of these password hash, password hash things long, it's 1,000 long, all you store is the first and the last part of the chain. And you can compute these chains in the forward direction. We assume that R you can just compute, and H you can compute. You cannot compute H inverse. So you cannot go from the hash of a password to the original password. But you can go forwards on this chain. So you can go from the hash of the password to using R to some new password to its hash, use R again to a new hash, and so on and so on and so on. And then what gets stored is the beginning and the end of the chain. The initial password and the final hash value, the end. With the idea being that the entire computed set of passwords and their hashes is buried in this chain. So if ever you find a password in a, in a password file, all you have to do is apply the reverse function, apply the hash function, apply the reverse function, apply the hash function, over and over and over and over, and every step along the way, check to see if you've hit one of the E's that you're storing. And the moment that you stumble upon a, a value E that you are storing in your one of your P comma E pairs, you can then restart this process with your P, hash that, reverse, hash that, reverse, hash that, reverse, until you finally are back where you started. Where with 
what you found in the password file. But that value that you just stumbled upon, you got there by hashing an actual password, which means that you now know what the password is. So in a sense, you want to reverse a hash function, and you do that by computing a reverse hash, reverse hash, reverse hash, all the way until you get to the end of the chain, linked to the beginning of the chain, and you compute it again in the forwards direction until you finally find where you started, but you remember what you just did, so then you have your password. So given a hash password x, run the computation forwards until you find a known e, then run it forward from p, the corresponding p, until you find x. Then the value you had right before, that's the password. This means that you only need to store p comma e, but buried within that is all of the information for how to find a password on this chain. And this is the time memory trade-off. It's slower because you're doing more computations. You're doing more hashes, more reverse operations, and you're doing these lookups in the table. But it allows you to store without having to use, say, three uh, terabytes of data, which would be unimaginable when this idea was proposed for a storage that would be available, to store the same corresponding amount of passwords. You just have to do more work. So you trade off more work for less storage. But now we have three terabytes might not be that much, but we can apply the same technique to store trillions or quadrillions or however many of these passwords that we want. The choice of the reverse function, this R that maps hashes back to password space, is important because we want to prioritize likely passwords, ideally, although we also want to cover all possible passwords. And as well, if it has collisions, if it, if it is a function that is rich with collisions, we won't notice right away. Because as we're building these chains, we don't remember all of the passwords that we ever looked at. All we remember all that we store is the p comma e pairs, the initial part of the chain and the end of the chain. So as we're building these hash chains, we might be stuck on a chain that we've already visited before. And then the thing that we end up storing, it's just going to waste space. It'll have a p comma e pair that we've already stored. And in this case, we started with a, some other p prime, and we end up at the same e. And so this is not only a waste of, sp of space, because now we have to store p comma e and p prime comma e, and we collided somewhere on this chain, and so we don't get the maximum benefit of this compression. But it's also a waste of time, because think about the algorithm that you would have to run in order to figure out the password. Remember, you're at a particular hash, you do the reverse hash, reverse hash, reverse hash until you get to a known E, and then you look up in the table and you see, oh, well, it could go to P, it could go to P prime, it could go to P double prime. Well, which one is it? Well, you don't have any information, so you have to try them all. So you would start the P chain and continue hashing along until you eventually hit E and see you didn't stumble upon the password you're looking for. So you try P prime and do that and try P double prime and then you find it. So if R is a function that collides a lot, meaning that it maps hashes to the same password, then we're going to waste time, we're going to waste space, and it's hard to detect. So let's look at this visually to really understand and make it clear what's happening. We have password space and we have hash space. In the password space, we can hash passwords, get some value in hash space. 
from hash space, we have a return function, r, that goes somewhere back to a password. The idea is, let's list all the passwords. So this would be a longer list than these. These are just the top passwords, I suppose. We have all the passwords in the password space. Each of these passwords has a corresponding hash. The hash of cat is, is ab34, you know, not precisely. I've, they're just arbitrary values, but you get the idea. So for every password, there is a characteristic hash that would be stored in the password file if you hashed it however appropriate according to the rules of the, the password hashing strategy that's being used for storage. So the reverse function just takes a password and turns it into some other, or takes rather a hash and turns it into some other password. The goal of the reverse function is not to be a precise one-to-one -one mapping or to be particularly complicated. It's just supposed to be a good faith effort to be able to go from a hash value back to some different password, some other random arbitrary password so that we can do a random walk through the password space and hash space. The idea is that, let's say we started with cat. If we hash cat, we get its hash. Then we use the reverse to get a new password. We hash that password to get its hash. We use a reverse to get a new password. We hash it to get, again, another hash. This is the chain. We can make this walk as long as we want. It's a random walk going alternating between password space and hash space. And it's deterministic. The hash function is deterministic. We make the R function deterministic. Both are deterministic. And we're able to create a long walk through this space. What gets stored, and this is the key part of the time memory trade-off, is that we only store the start and the end of the chain. This chain is one-way function. We can compute h, but we can't compute h inverse by the pre-image resistance property of hash functions. And we can compute r, maybe we can compute r reverse, it doesn't matter, we can't compute h reverse. So we can't go back on this chain. We can only go forward. But by storing the start and the end, we can circumvent this inability to go backwards on this chain by explicitly having a big loop from the end to the beginning. Right? This start and end is just two pieces of data. So this is what gets stored. We store only two pieces of data, but the chain itself can be arbitrarily long. There could be thousands of passwords that are represented using only two bits of or two pieces of information. To the start password and the end hash of that chain. And this is where the time memory trade-off occurs. We store less in terms of memory, but it takes longer to reverse a password in time. Let's see an example. Suppose we stole the password file and we saw this particular password, db34, da 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 da, or th we saw this hash rather. We saw this hash of db34. We can't just go to the password. We don't have the reverse hash function mapping. If we had a giant lookup table and db34 was on it, we could look up the answer. But we're assuming that we don't have enough memory to store the entire lookup table. So instead, what we do is we go forward on this function. We go to the reverse function, which gives us 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We hash that to get e2e5. And then we notice that we have e2e5 somewhere in our storage. We are storing that value as the end of a chain. So with that, we can go to the beginning of the chain. That tells us cat. So we go to cat, we hash it, we reverse it, we hash it, and voila, we see the password hash that we started with. So whatever we were just at, zxasqw, That is the password that we wanted. And the trade-off is that we had to redo the entire chain in order to get there. So if the chain was thousands long, we'd have to do a thousand operations to get to the password. If it was millions long, we'd have to do a million operations to get to the password. But we're able to store that factor of time more passwords in these chains than we actually have to store on disk. Meaning that if our chains were a thousand passwords long, the storing of a single password hash value allows us to represent a thousand times as much information.
simply by deterministically recomputing it. There is our password. So, a problem though arises. We can build more chains. Suppose we built another one, started with top secret, then to QWERTY, and we have a collision. That DB34 and 66AA both go to 12345. This reverse function, we want it to be some good faith effort to map to password space, but just like hash functions have collisions, the reverse function will also have collisions. And if we have a collision, then we're going to have two values that match on the end, meaning that when we end up with E2E5, when we did that loop earlier, and we're going to go to the start of the chain again, now there's two starts of the chain. We have to do double the work. And the more collisions we have, the more work we do. And the longer the chains are, the higher the likelihood of collisions. So the solution to this problem is known as rainbow tables. And a rainbow table solves the collision problem in building these hash chains. So instead of having one return function r, there's a family of them. r1 r dot 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 rk. And we build the chains by starting with r1 first, and then r2, and then r3, dot, 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 and then at r, then rk, and then that's the end. Meaning that we start with a password, p, we hash it, we use r1 to get a new password, we hash it, we use r2 to get the next one, hash it, and so on. This means that wasteful collisions only happen if they also occur on the same round. That is, when you're computing a hash chain, if you end up with r sub i of h sub 1 is equal to r sub i of h sub 2, then then you have a then you have a collision, a wasteful collision. But in the original proposal, any time r collided on two values, you would have a wasteful collision, regardless of where in the chain that collision occurred. With the rainbow table, r sub i of h sub one is not going to be equal to r sub j of h sub two. But if it is a collision, then it's not a guarantee that r i sub 1 and r sub i or r sub j plus 1 will continue to agree that is you can have a collision where two hashes point to the same new password through the reverse function, but the next round you're applying different reverse functions to the new hash of the password, which will be the same still. But those different reverse functions, as long as they won't agree, and there's no reason that they should, you just choose different R functions. So a collision that occurs has to not only occur for the same hash value, but it has to occur in the exact same position in the chain making these collisions much less likely to occur. So these rainbow tables do exist. You can download them. They exist. So these tables of all the passwords and their hashes in for unfathomably many possible passwords using the standard method of hashing passwords, they do exist. So how do we defeat them? 
The solution is that you store a salt. The server stores the user a random value called the salt and the hash of the password in that salt. This salt is an example of a kind of randomness which does not need to be cryptographically suitable. The idea is that every user gets a different salt. And so if I use the same password on two different sites, what gets saved in the password file is different. And it's different because the salt that is included at the beginning of the hashing of the password makes it the first hash just completely different. This also has the property that if someone compromises the password file and they see all of the users and all of their hashes, their rainbow tables are useless because the rainbow table will not take into account the salt. By including the salt in the hash of the password, I'm basically hashing a different password entirely. And the salt can be cryptographically long. It can just be a random 256-bit value. And we can't build rainbow tables for that. That is beyond the realm of the computationally feasible. So we can build rainbow tables for, say, 2 to the 30 passwords or 2 to the 40 passwords, which would be unfathomably many, but not 2 to the 128 passwords, which would be, in effect, what adding a random salt would do. So this is the best approach. This is the standard approach. This is what should be done every single time. And unfortunately, many times where password files have been leaked and there's been breaches of passwords, this is not what servers are doing. Servers are not doing the minimum that is required for the passwords to be secured. And so when they demand that you do things like add punctuation and uppercase and lowercase letters and you're not allowed to use this symbol but you have to use three different kinds of symbols and then they don't bother to hash and salt the passwords when they store it means that all of the work that they impose on users is inconsequential and has no benefit. Having complicated, hard-to-guess passwords is only useful if the server takes these basic precautions of hashing and salting the passwords when they store it in order to protect them. So the next question is, what should we use to hash a password? We introduced this idea of hashing it over and over and over and over and over again. This idea of strengthening the key, the key strengthening by chaining together many, many hashes. And really what that's meant to do is create an asymmetry where the brute force attack becomes harder while the server's computational load isn't that much harder for legitimate users. But the point is that MD5 and SHA-1 were designed to run as fast as possible while being collision and pre-adventure resistant. That was their design idea. Like, they should be simple to implement, they should run fast, and they should have these nice properties. So doing repeated hashing is kind of like a hack on this. It's, it's using these functions for something that they weren't actually supposed to. And so the observation here is that we should make use of a hash function that's pre-image resistant, but actually designed to not run fast, to not have this as part of its design criteria, so that it specifically can be used for performing these key strengthening operations. Another issue is that GPUs, which are these graphical processors, they're designed to be able to do computations in parallel. They're designed to be able to do things including hash operations, repeated hash, in parallel, and it can be done much faster than a simple CPU. And this creates an example of this sunk cost versus all fronts problem. In the idea that if the attacker has access to a GPU that can do hashing really fast, this means that 
the benefit of hashing it many, many times might be lost. The attacker just then uses their GPU to get around that, to do that really, to do a whole bunch of different hashes at the same time really quickly. And now the server stuck with this sunk cost where they have to do a lot of expensive hashes, but the attacker just needs to buy this piece of hardware and they can do this attack. And in fact, they don't even need to necessarily buy it for the idea that they could buy this piece of hardware and do this attack being an existential threat. So the idea was to use hash functions that aren't solvable using GPUs, that are designed to be pre-image resistant while not being parallelizable and not running really quickly. And so there was a competition for a password key derivation function, a password-based key derivation function. And the winner of that contest was Argon2. So in the same way that MD5 and SHA-1 are uh, are hash functions that were standardized, and now we use SHA-256 for anything security-related, Argon2 went through a similar process where it was won the competition and is now the preferred password-based key derivation function. So if you're going to use a password to derive a key, or if you're going to use a password to store in a database, in the sense that you're the server storing the password, you want to use argon2. This is the preferred function to implement exactly this security problem, the security mechanism. So argon2 as well takes into the into consideration the number of iterations and the salt. So it is designed to take a password and it can take an assault for that password. So it's already designed with this idea of storing these passwords in a password table. It also takes the number of iterations to run. So this is how many times the hash function repeats. So it doesn't need to be um, as large as uh, as many hashes the SHA-1 or SHA-256 would take, but the system administrator can set it as appropriate. So they can figure out how long their system would take to compute the corresponding key for an argon2 password based on x iterations and if that's a reasonable amount for their system um, they can choose that as the number of iterations but these are all uh, configurable parameters the the important thing is that these gpu attacks these specialized hardware attacks that allow md5 sha1 sha256 these family of hash functions to be computed extremely quickly aren't possible to do with the argon2 uh, hash function. So it, it slows down, it allows the attacker to really be slowed down in this brute force attack. All right, why do we use passwords? Why do we use passwords? People have said that the end of passwords is, is upon us for decades now, and yet we still use passwords all the time to do anything online. Passwords are something that every computer user is constantly, or not rather constantly, but extremely periodically throughout the day doing on a computer system to access various services. So what are some advantages and what are some disadvantages of passwords? We'll we'll start with the disadvantages of passwords, and I encourage you to pause the lecture and and think of some disadvantages of passwords. And on the next slide, I'll I'll go through a handful of the ones that I I can think of and that uh, seem to be uh, obvious disadvantages. So first, you have to memorize them. That that poses a, a cognitive burden on users. You have to memorize the passwords. There's inconsistent composition policies. For instance, one place may say you have to use a punctuation and a number and a capital letter, and another place might say, well, you can't use these punctuations for some arbitrary reason, but you can use these other ones. So suddenly this password that you have in your mind can't be used on that system, or other places will say you can't use punctuation at all. And so you have these no standard policy that just makes sense and is widely adopted. It's just everyone who sets up a password website can come up with their own arbitrary rules. You are you can't reuse passwords, or at least you're not supposed to, so you're supposed to have a different password for every single site that you visit. You're supposed to change them periodically as well, and there's really no sensible guidance on that. Some policies will just say you have to change it every X months no matter what, even though that is considered to be a bad practice and is not appropriate for storing 
uh, information according to the U.S. government's NIST standard says that if you require password changing frequently without any reason, you're not allowed to store confidential information on those systems. You have to have this balance between easy to remember passwords and hard to guess passwords. So the user has to be able to remember it, but then it can't be in the first hundred billion passwords that people are likely to use. So it has to be hard to guess. Passwords are vulnerable to capture and replay. By this, I mean, if Eve happened to witness the password, that is sufficient to authenticate as whoever's password that is forever or until it gets changed, which is why the guidance on changing your password every so often, which is to prevent this capture and replay attack. As we saw with the example of Eve capturing one signature of a Diffie-Hellman key negotiation parameter and the corresponding value, they can authenticate new sessions with Bob thenceforth. In this case, it's the same idea. If Eve knows Alice's password, Eve can type Alice's password in to, a, to the website, and the website will just assume it's Alice without any second thought about that. And finally, passwords are vulnerable to these online and offline guessing attacks. Online in the sense that anyone on the planet can go to a website and try to log in as someone and see if that password is correct. Whereas... And, or, and, and, and as well, if someone captures the password file for a particular website, they can do this attack offline, which would allow them to have unlimited number of guesses. We can throttle the password attempts for online guessing to make it that well, after 10 tries, your, your account shut down for 10 minutes or something like that. You get 10 more tries later. But for an offline guessing attack, you, once you have the password file, you can just keep hashing things until you find the hash that matches. So, with all these disadvantages of passwords, what are some advantages? So again, I encourage you to pause and think about some advantages of passwords that might exist, and we'll list a few of them now. So, advantages of passwords, they're simple to use and understand. Users can understand how they work and why they work, why there's this thing that only they know, and they can type it in, and that proves it's them. There's no hardware. Users who have a computer can just use passwords to log in. They don't need to be given some sort of token that gives them a number that they enter into a site. There's no additional hardware. There's nothing to carry that they need to keep around with them or take with them everywhere they go. They can use the password on any machine as long as it has a keyboard. It's quick to log in. It's a very short protocol. The server says, what's your password? The client gives the password. The protocol is finished. If the password is lost or compromised for some reason, it's easy to change. A user can simply go and change all their passwords. If a user's, for instance, their house key was somehow copied, they would have to go and change all of the locks in their house in order to be secure again. Whereas in a similar idea, here they just change their passwords, but the cost of changing a password is simply updating a line in a database file. So it's a very easy change to make. The failure mode is clear, so users can have a clear understanding of how passwords work and why they fail. So there's a lot of training that's required to teach users how to use passwords correctly. There's no trust in a third party. There's no central authority that's managing who gets to log in where and is aware of all this information. It's simply a Alice and Bob protocol. And it's also easily delegated for cases where you might want someone else to be able to log in quickly, though it is hard to undelegate. So yes, if you needed someone else to log in to your email to get you some information from it, you can just tell them your password and then they can log in. So you can delegate very easily. But of course, once you've done that, you'll have to, you know, hope that they don't do other things and hope that they don't change your password on your behalf or something like that. You have to have trust in them. And then you'd have to go and change your password is the only way to, in a sense, undelegate that information. So we talked about these password guessing attacks. So here's an example of a password guessing attack. So you may have seen in the news that the former president in the United States, his Twitter account was accessed by a security expert who managed to guess that his password was mega2020 exclamation point. 
Perhaps Twitter required a piece of punctuation in the password, and that's why that exclamation point is there. I don't know. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, when I talked about the importance of following the laws and that the things that we teach in this course can not necessarily actually be done, it's worth pointing out that the story begins with Dutch prosecutors who investigated the security researcher, dot, 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 believed that the hacker had actually penetrated Trump's Twitter account, but has met the criteria that has been developed in case law to go free as an ethical hacker. So please keep this in mind that doing things like this will get attention from the police and you can get into serious trouble for doing things like that. So never attempt to log into an account that isn't yours. Never attempt to guess someone else's password these are actual crimes that you're not permitted to do. Now, in this case, the person who was doing it is actually working for a security firm who was trying to break into high-profile politicians and other such accounts so as to warn them and make sure that their passwords were, in fact, secure. So the in this particular instance, the police decided that he had not committed a crime as their particular or jurisprudence had developed in, in terms of their case law. But this isn't the case in every jurisdiction, and it's very important that you do not do anything that involves accessing a computer system or any sort of resources that do not belong to you. What about password recovery? This is the mechanism that occurs if a user's password is forgotten. And this, forgetting a password, this is the major failure mode of passwords, right? We have all these passwords for all these sites, and we are supposed to remember them all, and they have different criteria. Some need punctuation, some can't have punctuation, and we have to remember all of these things, and often well, we can't. This is a, a huge burden on users, and as a result, passwords do get forgotten. And the other major failure mode of passwords is that they're stolen, they're compromised, and someone else can use them. So in the first case, the passwords are forgotten. That's one failure mode. The other is too many people know the password, The in a sense, the opposite of that. Now... The idea behind a password recovery system, in principle, is that the server then authenticates the user in some other way. So the user forgot their password, the server then determines somehow that the user is indeed the user, and then delivers a new working password to that user. Now, if you've ever used a system where you click the forgot your password, and they email you your password in plain text, then that means that the server has failed in storing your passwords correctly. And hopefully they haven't done something like requiring users to have lots of punctuations and complicated passwords and so forth like that, because they haven't done the bare minimum to secure your password. If they know your password, they are storing your password incorrectly because the server should never be able to remind you what your password is. They should just give you a new password because if they can compute your password, it means that an attacker who breaches their database can compute your password, which means all of the security mechanisms of having complicated passwords serve absolutely no purpose. Typically, when you do a password recovery, they'll send you a password, a new password, or they'll send you a link over email. This idea represents that your Access to email involves some other form of authentication, password-based authentication that occurs, that you were able to successfully do, and thereby access this information and there then access this site. So this means that there's now two ways of logging in. Either of these two passwords can work. I can log in to my account on some system using that password, or I can log into it by logging into my email, doing a password reset, clicking on the link, and getting a new password and logging in after all. And this is, comes back to this idea of weakest link security. If your password to your email happens to be easier to guess than the password to the system, then the attacker who can guess your email password can then get into the system. So whichever password will be easier to break will be the way that the attacker can get access to this system. We ha now have two different ways of authenticating. 
And what their what the system that's doing a password reset is doing is implicitly trusting that your email access is secure, trusting that that email provider and your means of accessing that email is perfectly secure. They're offloading that onto onto the email provider and allowing you simply by being able to check your email to access this information. Another common issue has to do with default passwords. So again, defaults don't change. So defaults should be set to be secure. For instance, routers will have a default admin password. And as we saw earlier, there's information about that can just be looked up for the default passwords for routers. There was a story in Pennsylvania, the ice cream phone shop scam. The that happened here was that the voicemail pin number, so the code that allowed a user to remotely configure their voicemail, defaulted to the last four digits of the phone number. So easy for users to know. So what's my pin code? Well, it's just the last four digits of the phone number. I know the phone number, so I'll just, then I know the pin number. But that means that every single other person on the planet also will know what that pin number is if they know the phone number. So anyone who can call in to this voicemail system, if unless you go out of your way and change the pin for your voicemail, anyone else will be able to do that. And so what's the harm? You know, it, it's not that crucial. Well, what the criminals did was they changed the outgoing voicemail message to, I accept collect call. This has the effect that when an incoming call goes to voicemail, if that incoming call is a collect call, the voice operator is waiting for a message of the form, I accept the charges, I accept the collect call, and hears it. So the attackers were then able to make thousands of dollars worth, incur thousands of dollars of actual bills to this ice cream shop by making collect calls, by having collect calls get accepted automatically by this ice cream shop. There was a U.S. courthouse. They, are, they had a server that had records, sensitive information, court proceedings that were still under seal, such like that. Password public, username public, public slash public, not a secure password. In the, the, the you know, New York Times, which is a newspaper in the United States, they have in a database for their employees and the password was equal to the last four digits of their social security number. This is equivalent to the social insurance number we have here in Canada. As we talked about earlier, this is a number that we're supposed to somehow never tell anyone, except we're frequently asked by tax authorities or by banks or by credit authorities or by every employer what it is, and we give it away. Yet it's supposed to have the security purpose that we never tell anyone what it is, and this security purpose has only been added after the fact. The, the number itself was never intended to have a security purpose. It somehow evolved to have one now. And then the New York Times further it's decided, well, we can use the fact that no one knows what a social security number is to have that as the password for, for the employees, for the database for each employee. Well, if you happen to know someone else's social security number then you happen to gain access to this information as well. So another story related to this default password, there's a story of Gary McKinnon. He was a Scottish sysadmin and a hacker. In 2001-2002, he hacked 97 U.S. military and NASA computers. So, seems like quite a sophisticated hacker. What was his approach? Or rather, what was his goal? He wanted to find evidence of UFO cover-ups, don't we all? And evidence that there's already technologies to do free energy that is clean and unlimited, and it was being intentionally suppressed so that corporations could make money selling energy at a cost. His method? A Perl script that randomly looked for blank and default passwords to administrator accounts. So he was just shooting wildly, trying every single computer, single script, trying to connect to and manage to connect to 97 
different military and space agency computers because administrator accounts had either a blank or a default password. There was an attack known as the RockU hack. RockU was a social gaming company, whatever that means. This was in 2009. It had a database with 32 million user passwords from partner social networks. So they were, I guess, collecting from other social networks password databases. And these passwords were stored in the clear. In the clear. So they were just storing the password as is in a file on their servers. It was hacked in 2009. The entire database with an SQL injection attack gave the attackers all of the passwords. And we'll have an entire lecture on code injection, in particular SQL injection attacks at another point in time. But for now, just know that if you are storing a password file on a computer, it is a threat, it can be attacked. And in this case, if you're storing it in plain text, then the attacker will be able to get the plain text password of all of these users. So, what were the top passwords among this list of passwords? Well, you can think of your passwords. You can think of maybe the worst passwords you've ever had, at least in terms of where, how far, how high up the list they would be in terms of an attacker guessing it. And think about, look at the keyboard and think about what the top passwords might be and see if any of the ones that you guess match the ones off this list. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. The less uh, sophisticated 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Followed by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Getting, getting longer and longer. Then password with a capital P. I love you, all lowercase. Princess. Rock you, which I'm assuming is specifically for this particular site, which was called Rock you. Not because that's a typical choice. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're back to that theme again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and ABC one, two, three. So these would be easy to guess passwords if you are building a list of all the ones that you wanted to attack. And public e exposure of these password lists further help the attacker because then they actually have ground truth evidence. They don't have to guess what the most common passwords would be. Oh. They just know what the actual common passwords are. There was another breach that occurred, this time with Adobe, in 2013. They had a leak of 38 million active user accounts. Now, this time, the passwords weren't sent in the plain text. They were encrypted. Good. They used triple DES, which is not what you should have been using in 2013. But so be it. They also used it in ECB mode, which you should never be using, as we already talked about. So not best practice in terms of hashing and salting the password. Not best practice in terms of using the AES, Advanced Encryption Standard, but using something developed in the 70s or 80s. Not best practice by incorrectly using the block cipher mode. Now, the key was not leaked, and it managed to remain secure. But ECB mode does not have this semantic security property. If one user has the password ABC123 and another user has the password ABC123, the ECB mode encryption of that will be the same. So they'll end up seeing, but you won't know that it's ABC123, but you'll see the same password in, in this garbage. So you'll be able to see the same encrypted random looking string and conclude that these two people have the same password. Now, the true bizarre and beautiful aspect of this leak was that it included a usable, a user settable password hint, meaning that not only would you know when two people had the same passwords, but you would see if two people had different hints that might reveal what 
that password is. And we have an exercise related to this that will come up in uh, one of the uh, homeworks exercises where you'll be able to see examples of exactly this. But in effect, you can imagine that the password for or this two people with the same password, Michael, you can even just see in this database, one has as their hint, my son or son's name, and another has the hint basketball or basketball player, another has a hint Jordan. So with this kind of hint information and the fact that you know that all these hints correspond to the same password, you can then piece together this uh, incredible crossword puzzle. The LinkedIn hack of 2012 had 177 million unsalted SHA-1 password hashes. The most common among them, very similar list to the one we saw before. It appears as though they had a minimum length of six, as none of the passwords on this, at least the top list, had a length shorter than six. One, two, three, four, five, six. LinkedIn, sure enough, the, the name of the account. Password, 1 through 9, 1 through 8, 6 ones, 1 through 7, 6 down to 1. QWERTY, just the stringing along the top of the keyboard, sunshine, and 6 zeros. Now, the LinkedIn hack had another interesting consequence, because they found the unsalted hash of Trump's password, because he had a uh, LinkedIn account, and this was pre-president era, so they knew what the hash of the password was. So if they did a brute force attack, they could actually figure out what it is. And so they did it. They figured it out that it's your fired. And how did it manage to log in to Twitter? Well, this is known as credential stuffing. So the first part of the attack is you do a dictionary attack to get the password because you compromise the password database somewhere at LinkedIn. And then the second part, where I have here party, it should be part. Second part is credential stuffing, which is then you just try this password in every other box that will accept a password with the same user under the assumption a reasonable and in practice a reality that people reuse passwords. And for good reason, because there's no way to be able to memorize a complicated password for every single site that you're visiting. So the compromise from LinkedIn allowed the attackers to then compromise the other account at another site using a username password that you found in one place, logging in somewhere else with the same username password. This indeed is why they say use different passwords for different sites, because your security of your password is basically up to the least competent place that stores it. So if the least competent place stores it plain text and they get compromised, your password's out. If the least competent place stores it just hashed but not salted and it gets out, someone at the rainbow table can then look it up and then try it in other sites. It's only when every single site stores it hashed and salted using Argon2 that your password is actually secure. We have to assume that these sites will get compromised, and if not, there's still insiders working in there who have access to these password databases. And the only thing you can do is secure the database that stores your passwords using the best practices and now this is up to every single administrator to do this correctly, and evidence shows that this is not the case. Now, of course, the evidence is typically from failures where passwords were breached, so of course it's biased in the sense that every time, of course, there is a password breach, there's likely going to have been maybe lack security in the first place, which suggests that best practices also weren't being followed. But so nevertheless, your password is as safe as the least competent place that stores it. What about Sarah Palin's email hack? Sarah Palin was a, uh, a candidate in the United States election uh, a decade or more ago, and uh, for vice president, I believe, 
And she had a, um, she used an email service that was not run by the governor, or uh, run by the government when she was a governor, governor governor.palin at yahoo.com. So she was not using the government email servers, but her own private email server. I don't know why. I thought that using private email servers was a bad thing somehow. And the thing to remember is that these private email servers, they're just functioning normally. They don't think in terms of high power users. Now, perhaps Trump on Twitter was considered the had a special access for his account, but as we saw when the hacker logged in with MAGA 2020 exclamation point from the Netherlands, it didn't seem that, in fact, it was treated that differently, or alarm bells were going off based on that. And in the same here, Sarah Palin's email, it allowed it to be reset by anyone who happened to know information that only Sarah Palin could know, such as her date of birth and her zip code and where she met her spouse, right? These sort of security questions, which are meant to suggest that the only person on the planet who knows this is the person who is trying to reset their password, in which case, why even use a password? We should just have these questions to log in instead, instead of passwords, because if you can circumvent a password by just answering these questions, then you might as well just have the answers to this question be your password. Well, when was she born? She's a public person, so that was on Wikipedia. What is her zip code? Well, she lived in a town in Alaska that has two zip codes. So a zip code uh, is the American equivalent of a postal code. There was two in her area, so that very quickly narrowed down the range of possible values. And next question, where did you meet your spouse? Well, you know, if that's not a matter of public record having been said at some campaign event type thing, the answer is probably city in Alaska somewhere. And again, the number of possibilities there is not going to be overwhelmingly large. The hacker changed the password to popcorn and then went to jail. So again, don't do this. These are serious offenses, even though uh, it seems quite easy to do these. The idea of these security questions in the ideal is that only Alice knows and then tells Bob the answer to. And now only Bob and Alice know. So Bob can ask a question of Alice to authenticate and the answer of your zip code and your mother's maiden name and things like that is the answer and, you know, thereby proves it must be you. And in in essence, the question, what is your password, is essentially this. What is your password is essentially a security question premised around the idea that only Alice and Bob know the answer to this question. In practice, these security questions are terrible for a variety of reasons. They don't work at all. They're all easily, easily guessable it's a very, very ineffective system. So what are some flaws? They can be inapplicable. What high school did your spouse attend? Again, this is not going to necessarily be a giant secret that only one, that only Alice and the server know. Presumably, the spouse will know what high school he went to as well. His kids might know, his parents might know. So the idea that only the person authenticating could know what high school their spouse went to is absurd. But still, if they're unmarried, where did you go on honeymoon? If you're unmarried, these are not even applicable questions. It could be not memorable. What is the name of your kindergarten teacher? I have no idea. Maybe some people, it stood out more. There's certainly teachers I've had that stood out. But if you assign a particular grade or topic or subject, I can't remember necessarily the name of the, of the teacher. They're ambiguous. What is the name of a university that you apply to but did not attend? Well, there could be more than one. How do you remember which one you said? They could be easily guessable based on a small domain. What's your favorite color? Well, you could ask 
this question on Mechanical Turk and get thousands of answers and then see what the answers are. Just from top to bottom, first blue, then green, then red, see which ones come first. People aren't likely picking puce and mauve and off-white as their favorite colors. Or, again, it's a matter of public record, such as a mother's maiden name. Not only is it just the information may be out in the hands of other people, but it's, it's a part of a public database that's accessible, right? The idea that the mother's maiden name is somehow this piece of information that no one else on the planet knows, aside from uh, presumably the mother and most of her family. The thing is, a mother's maiden name is a fact. It's not a secret. And especially in 2021, it's not even uh, appropriate to think that mothers should change their name when they get married anyhow. So a mother's maiden name may very well be her name. A study found that mother's maiden name for one-fifth of Texans, uh, Texas being a, a, a large state in the United States, they found a fifth of mother's maiden names using only free public information. So in an effort to give some evidence to why mother's maiden name is a ridiculous security question, they were able to show that for one-fifth of, of residents in a state, they were able to discover their mother's maiden name without paying a dime for any information. And if they had been willing to pay, they would have been able to get even more access to more databases and so forth. Another example for this social security number being used as a security mechanism was from an email I got for some work I had done in the United States. Attached is your 2019 W-2, some tax form. The password to open your file is your last four digits of your social security number. So even if I were the only person who knew the last four digits of my social security number, this is still vulnerable to a brute force attack. And it turns out I don't actually have the last four digits of my social security memorized. It's just not really something that ever comes up in my life. And I have no idea where the card is either. So I just wrote this Python program to try all 10,000 possible four digits numbers and turned out it was somewhere near the end of that list and was able to decrypt the file with a simple brute force attack. So we have these passwords, and they're widely used, but they have their flaws. So what else can we do? Well, we also have this public key cryptography, where we have one part of it secret and one part public. What if we could use these signatures to help us? Instead of giving a password, we give proof that we are in possession of a private key. So the password is something you know, the private key is now something you have. Because if you've ever used public key cryptography to authenticate into a server, such as SSH typically is being is done with, then you'll know that you don't actually know what your private key is, and it's presumably too long to memorize. But you secure the computer that stores it. You have the computer that stores it, you protect that with a password so other people can't get into it, and now you're able to prove something you have that is, knowledge of your private key. Suppose that Alice wants to connect to Bob. Bob knows Alice's public key. Bob wants Alice to connect, but needs evidence that it's Alice. So how could this work? Well, Bob could issue Alice a challenge. So Bob, for instance, just picks a number and says to Alice, sign this number. Give me a signature of this number. And Alice signs the message, signs the number, and gives the signature back to Bob. In order to do this, Alice must therefore have the private key, so whoever is on the other end of that socket that Bob is talking to must be in possession of this public of the private key corresponding to the public key belonging to Alice, therefore it must be Alice, therefore let her in. So what can go wrong with this? Well, first, there's a replay attack. Suppose Eve monitors all communication 
and Bob reuses challenges? Well, then Eve already has the answer. If Bob ever reuses a challenge, and Eve was aware of Alice's response, Eve could simply replay Alice's response. Alice has a signature, or Eve has a signature for that response, and Bob would let her in. So Bob must never reuse challenges. So one way to do that is you could use the time stamp because time is always increasing. But there's a problem there in that how do computers know what time it is? Well, they connect to servers that tell them. And they get information from local time services over the network time protocol, NTP. And there's a tax on NTP that we'll talk about in later lectures. So Bob can be misled about what time it is. There are time travel attacks that can exist. A better solution, just use pure, true randomness at that moment. Have it long enough that the chance of it ever being re reused is extremely unlikely, and seed it with fresh randomness every time. So there's always going to be a fresh challenge. Don't reuse challenges. Include the timestamp, include random numbers as well. So this way, even if the random number is wrong, the timestamp will recover. If the timestamp is wrong, then the random number will take over, right? Defense in depth. Why decide between timestamp or random number? Just use both. There's also another problem, though, and this is known as mafia fraud. This is a, an attack that works as follows. Suppose that Eve can, or Alice connects to Eve willingly. Let's say Eve runs some website, like some illegal downloading site or something like that. So Eve is running some sketchy website. Alice goes to Eve's sketchy website and willingly authenticates. So with Eve, Alice is ready to authenticate with Eve. Eve then connects to Bob, pretending to be Alice. So Eve, as soon as Alice indicates that she wants to connect to Eve's evil site, Eve goes to Bob and says, Hi, I'm Alice. I want to connect to Bob.com. Bob then issues who he thinks is Alice, but is truly Eve, a challenge to sign. Now, Eve cannot sign this challenge. But what Eve can do is pretend as though that's the challenge she thought of that is for Alice to get onto Eve's evil website. So Alice willingly signs it. Alice is trying to connect to a website. Eve says, here's your challenge. Alice signs the challenge. And Eve takes that signed challenge and says, here you go, Bob.com. Here's the challenge uh, signed, as you asked. This is also known as the chess grandmasters problem. And the, the premise of the question is, how is a young girl named Anna Louise able to defeat a grandmaster in chess? Grandmasters in chess are highly skilled players, and it's unlikely that a young player would be able to defeat a grandmaster in chess. However, if this player was actually playing two grandmasters at the same time, one of the two grandmasters would have to lose. Unless there was, of course, a draw. So as long as one of the two grandmasters loses, the other grandmaster wins. Now, if this Anna Louise goes to the first grandmaster and says, you go first, Grandmaster makes their move. She could then do the exact same move to the other Grandmaster, who responds with a, with, a, with a retaliation move. That move can then be forwarded to the original Grandmaster, going back and forth, where these two Grandmasters are effectively playing each other, but they don't realize they believe that they're playing this young girl instead. And eventually, when one beats the other, it will look like... Anna Louise lost against one Grandmaster, and yet won against the other. So why is it called Mafia Fraud and not Man in the Middle Attack? Well, there's a, there's a detail missing. In this case, 
Al- Eve is in the middle. There is Alice, there is Bob, and there is an Eve who's in the middle, who is intercepting the communication, so to speak. But in a mafia fraud or the Grand Master problem, the victim, Alice, willingly and knowingly communicates with the attacker. What they are unaware is that they're communicating in, in reality with the other victim. Alice and Bob are both victims in the scenario, but in a man-in-the-middle attack, Eve is situated between Alice and Bob, and Alice thinks she's talking to Bob, and Bob thinks she's talking to Alice. Whereas in Mafia Fraud, Alice thinks she's talking to Eve. But in reality, she's talking to Bob, and Bob thinks he's talking to Alice. So this is the difference. With Mafia Fraud, the attacker, or the victim, willingly begins communication with the attacker. And that's used to authenticate a session to somewhere else. Man in the Middle involves victims unknowingly communicating with the attacker. What about phone code authentication? You may have experienced this. You ha- everyone has a phone in their pocket. This is something they have. So this can now be used for a form of authentication. If you get a text message to your phone with a code, you can then type that code and log into a website. So you want to log into your bank. The bank says, hey, this is weird because you've never logged in from this particular country before. So we're just going to check to make sure it's you. Uh, As long as you have your phone, you still have access to your number. You're the only one who can receive text messages at this number. Here's a text message with this code. Enter in the code. The user then enters in the code. So, what's wrong with the message that you receive looking like your login code is 24? Well, not enough of a domain, not enough possible values, easily guessed, presumably. What's wrong with your login code is this mess? Well, the opposite problem. Now a user has to actually type all this. They've received it on their phone and now they're typing it by hand onto a computer. This is a nightmare. What's wrong with your login code is this number? Well, this is actually reasonable now. It's not so big that it poses a user burden to type in. It's not so small that someone else could just guess it. The problem here is that there is no information about who is sending this. This can be mafia fraud. And there are banks that send messages like this that do not tell you who they are or why this is coming, what what this is for. Mafia fraud. I go to the shady website. The shady website says, we're going to send you a text message, log in with this code. The shady website doesn't send me a text message. Instead, they log into my bank and my bank sends me the code. Then I forward that code to the shady website and the shady website finishes authenticating with the bank, logging in. Another kind of authentication that has been done is with a sheet of passwords. These Each one can be used once. So you might get a, a, a matrix of 100 numbers. And each of these numbers can be used to log in once. So Bob can ask for a particular number, say, give me the number from column H, row 3, or can say, just give me any number on this list. Of course, if you say, give me any number on the list, then suddenly more numbers are available to authenticate. So you may want to ask for a specific number. Another form of authentication, Alice and Bob have a shared key K. So somehow they share a key. And at any particular time T, Alice uses the key or uses the the code that is generated by encrypting the time, encrypting her name, Alice, or username, or what have you, encrypting Bob's name, who she's trying to connect to, and the encryption of that with the secret key K is the password. Alice can compute this, Bob can compute this. Obviously, if you're using time, you're going to have to round it. You don't want it millisecond granularity, but say every 10 seconds. If you've ever used an RSA-like token, this is basically how they work. <laughs> 
And when you're lose when you lose this token, you notice that it's missing. It's something you have. You can tell your system administrator, "Hey, I've lost my token." I, first, I need a new one. Second, you know, don't let anyone log in with this token until I have my new one. All right? This is the idea of something you have. And this can be combined with some, something you know, the password. So you enter your password, you enter your token, your two-factor authentication. Uh, and here uh, at the University of Calgary, of course, we all have this two-factor authentication set up. These non-password authentications can be used as a second factor, right? This can be done based on a judgment call. For instance, there's an unusual circumstance. You're logging in from another country. You're logging in outside of normal work hours. You've never logged in at this time before. You're about to do something extraordinary. You're about to access HR records. You're about to access tax information. You're about to change your password. You're about to perform something that has economic consequences like a, a, a major stock trade. You're about to buy something. This can be used to double check this information. Two factor is important because passwords are not enough. In 2012, 76% of network intrusions exploited weak or stolen credentials. Things like keystroke loggers or shoulder surfing, that is just looking at someone entering their password. People using the same passwords in multiple places, so credential stuffing. And the fact that we use two-factor authentication at the university for something like email, but not, for instance, at our banks in Canada, is, is crazy. We should be using two-factor authentication for as particularly things like banks that have a higher risk associated with a compromised account.